discs turn into coins to show us the final manifestation of the energy at the end of our journey. The coins have very interesting symbols on them, and we will be deciphering them in a moment, but first let's hear what Crowley tells us about this card. This is the last of all the cards, and therefore represents the sum total of all the work that has been done from the beginning. Therefore, in it is drawn the very figure of the tree of life itself. This card, to the other 35 small cards, is what the 21st trump, the universe, is to the rest of the trumps. Hello, my name is Beata. Welcome to another episode of my thought series. In this one, we will be talking about the 10 of discs. If you find my videos valuable, you can show your support by becoming a patron or with a one-time donation through PayPal. All links are in the video description below. Thank you very much for considering this. Your support will allow me to continue making these videos for you. Okay, let's get back to the 10 of discs now. Crowley mentions here the other 35 small cards. And this means all pip cards, so all number cards, without the aces. Aces represent the pure power of each element, and therefore they are not assigned to any decans, so they are excluded from this set. So we have the energy of all of those 35 cards finalized in the 10 of discs. And this is the final step of their journey, and the final manifestation of the energy that we were following from the beginning. We are now in the last sephira of the last of the worlds, the Malkuth of Isaiah. Crowley tells us that the number 10, Malkuth, as always represents the final issue of the energy. Here is great and final solidification. The force is completely expanded, and results in death. He also tells us in another place that there is actually a way out, because energy can never cease to exist, it can only be transformed into something else. Here again is written this constantly recurring doctrine that as soon as one gets to the bottom, one finds oneself at the top. When wealth accumulates beyond a certain point, it must either become completely inert and cease to be wealth, or call in the aid of intelligence to use it rightly. So we are at the end of the road, and we have accomplished all that we set out to do, and we can either stagnate and despair that there is nowhere else for us to go, or we can use what we accomplished to do some good in the world, and through this, we will be able to find a new purpose and a new meaning, something else to strive for. Crowley even gives us some practical examples of people who have gone through this journey and were able to find a good solution. This must necessarily happen in spheres which have nothing whatever to do with material possessions as such. In this way, Carnegie establishes a library, Rockefeller endows research, simply because there is nothing else to do. But all this doctrine lies behind the card. It is the inner meaning of the card. So we see that the real meaning of the last step in the whole path of the Minor Arcana is to be able to share what we have accumulated throughout our journey. The ten golden coins in this card show us a completed tree of life, and all coins, apart from one, connected to Sephira Hod, have a symbol of Mercury on them. Mercury is the ruler of this Deccan, and the ruler of Virgo, where he is also exalted, which makes him very powerful in this placement. And we will talk about the Deccan in just a moment, but first, let's look at all of the symbols of Mercury. Keter has the usual astrological symbol of Mercury, the one that we are all used to. 
Hokma is a combination of all planetary glyphs together. So Mercury here is presented as one with all of the other planets. Bina is the alchemical symbol of Mercury as used by the Golden Dawn. Hesed is the letter Pa that we read as Bey in Enochian alphabet and this is an equivalent of letter B in English. And we have it here because of what we will see in the following sephira. Gevora is Hebrew letter Beth, so also a B in English. And this letter is associated with the major arcana card Magus, associated with Mercury, of course. Tiferet has Raphael spelled out in Hebrew, and this is the name of the angel who is the ruler of Mercury. So all classical planets have ruling angels. Netzach has an eight-pointed star of Mercury, and this is a symbol of Hod. The eight-pointed star is also a star of Mesopotamian goddess Ishtar. Ishtar can be seen as a counterpart of Venus in, in a certain way, but her powers are far wider than what was later associated with Venus. And there is also a very interesting story about Rudolf Steiner, the founder of Anthroposophy, claiming that the associations of the two planets, Venus and Mercury, were swapped to conceal their true meaning. And this is of course not true and was based on a misunderstanding. But it's interesting that in this card, since we don't have a sign of Mercury in the Sephira Hod, the symbol of Hod was moved to the other side of the Tree of Life, to Netzach. And now we get to Hod. We need to see why we have a glyph of Sun here. And this is a hexagram within a hexagon, showing a solar power, and this is usually a symbol of Tiferet. You probably remember it from the Six of Swords and Six of Discs, where I explained its meaning in detail. Let's hear how Crowley explains why we have a solar symbol here. This indicates the only possibility of issue from the impasse produced by the exhaustion of all the elemental forces. At the end of matter must be complete stagnation. Were it not that in it is always inherent the will of the Father, the great architect, the great arithmetician, the great geometer. So this quote is a bit dense, and we will hear the second part of it in a moment, but first let's try to decipher the meaning. The exhaustion of all the elemental forces relates to where we are on the tree of life, we have traveled through all of the emanations of all four worlds and therefore all four elements. So all of the forces have already been used up in a sense. And this creates an impasse. We have nowhere else to move, so the energy should just stagnate completely. But we need to remember that everything that exists is infused with divine energy. So the will of the Father, the great architect, the great arithmetician, the great geometer, is the will of God, or the will of the divine, however you choose to see it. And because we have this divine element in all creation, transformation is always possible. There is always a way out. Nothing can be a definite end. And this is the role of the solar energy in this card. But let's also see what is the role of Mercury. Let's hear the second part of that quote now. In this case, then, Mercury will represent the Logos, the Word, the Will, the Wisdom, the Eternal Son, and Virgo the Virgin, in every implication of that symbol. And again we have quite a lot of information here, but let's try to unpack it. So the Logos, the Word, the Will, the Wisdom, this all relates to what Crowley says in his description of the Magus card. And he says, 
Mercury is preeminently the bearer of the wand, energy sent forth. This card therefore represents the wisdom, the will, the word, the logos by whom the worlds were created. It represents the will. So we can see that Mercury is seen here as the one that transmits the energy of the divine into the world. He is the word that creates the world. So his task is to focus the divine energy in order to achieve a practical result. And when we think of Mercury as messenger of the gods, we can understand this concept on two different levels. Superficially, he carries the messages of gods, sort of like a divine postman. But on a deeper level, he executes their will. And we see this in some legends about Mercury, but it's even more apparent when we look at his Egyptian counterpart, Thoth. Thoth is always seen as facilitating some events. He offers help to other gods, gives them spells, and guides them in performing rituals. So it looks more like he is the link between the pure divine power and the gods. So maybe he is even the link between the gods and the source of all their power. And now let's look at why Mercury is the eternal sun. If we go back to what Crowley says about the Magus, we will find this quote. In brief, he is the sun, the manifestation in act of the idea of the father. So this is just another way of expressing what we already understand. He is the sun because he expresses in action, he manifests the energy of the father, meaning the divine or God. And we also need to mention that Crowley says that the creative Mercury is of the nature of the sun. And we will be discussing all of this again in greater detail when we get to the Magus card. But for now, let's just mention that Mercury as a planet, like Venus, has two different aspects. If it's rising before the sun, it's a morning star and is then called Apollo. If it's rising after the sun, it's an evening star and it's called Hermes. And the morning star aspect of a planet is always considered as more active. So this is what is meant in the quote by the creative Mercury. Apollo is a twin brother of Artemis and she was described in the Princess of Swords episode. They are children of Zeus and Leto which makes him a half-brother of Hermes and complicates things for us. And unfortunately, we often have these problems with mythology, that some deities are lumped together, or their stories are presented a bit differently in different sources. And so we just need to learn how to embrace the ambiguity. Apollo is a god of archery, music, dance and poetry, truth and prophecy healing and diseases, and the sun, and light. And when we look at it conceptually, if Mercury, the planet, rises before the sun, it seems like it's bringing the light of the sun into the world. And we can understand why the association of Mercury and the sun was made. Mercury is also the planet that is the closest to the sun we never see it further away than one zodiac sign. And it's worth to mention as well that Apollo was never actually a personification of the sun. There is another god called Helios that is identified with the sun. And it's interesting as well, even though we might be getting into too much detail here, but let's face it, if you're still watching this, it's because you want all of the detail. So Helios, as the sun, has a sister, Selene, or Selene, who is a personification of the moon. And this echoes the way Apollo is associated with the sun and his sister Artemis with the moon. 
but they are not the personifications of the luminaries because they are lower down on the divine family tree. They are children of Zeus, but Helios and Selene are children of Zeus's uncle, so they are a generation higher or earlier than Apollo and Artemis. Okay, uh, let's get back to the main point now. And it's also interesting to note that Apollo was the one who gave Hermes his staff that later became the caduceus, the winged staff with two intertwined serpents. And they were also both worshipped together in certain circumstances, so there's definitely a very close connection between them. So we see now that seeing a solar symbol in Hod is not such a strange idea as we might initially assume. We know now where this energy comes from, and we see how it is related to one of the powers of Mercury. Now let's move on to Yesod. We have here a Pythagorean Tetractus, and this is a figure consisting of ten points in four rows, forming a shape of a triangle. And this is a mystical symbol, and we can't fully see all of the numbers here, but we can see that the last one is 2080, so 2080. And this is the sum of all of the numbers in the magic square of Mercury. So finally, we have Malkuth at the very end, and Crowley says that the tenth coin is much larger than the rest. The image indicates the futility of material gain. And we have a caduceus wand here, made out of three mother letters in Hebrew, so Shin, Aleph, and Mem, relating to three elements, fire, air, and water. So this is both the end of our path, but we also have all of the divine power to transform this stagnating energy into a new beginning. And we need to hold the wand now and use our will to create something new. Crowley says that this card is in fact a hieroglyph of the cycle of regeneration. So really, this card is showing us the energy that we need to use in order to move on to the next step. And we haven't really talked about the Deccan yet, although we might be seeing the same themes being repeated here. So I will keep it short and we will focus more on the one interesting aspect, which is the timing of this Deccan. And we are now in the last Deccan of Virgo, and as I mentioned before, this Deccan is ruled by Mercury, who rules the sign of Virgo, and is also exalted in this placement. Mercury is the only planet that is exalted in the sign of its rulership. It's also the only planet that is not assigned to feminine or masculine energy, to day or night sect, or to benefic or malefic nature. Mercury is simply above all divisions. And when you think about it, Mercury is even above divisions that apply to the luminaries. The timing of this Deccan is from the 12th of September until the 22nd of September. So if you are watching this episode when it was released, we are just out of this Deccan, which is a lovely sign of synchronicity. And the ending of this Deccan is of course one of the Sabbaths of the year, Mabon. And this is the middle one of the Harvest Sabbaths, preceded by Lunasa and followed by Samwen. And this is the time of the autumn equinox, which means that day and night are equal. And if you remember, the card that, that begins Minor Arcana, the Two of Wands, is associated with the spring equinox. And I have just checked, actually, I published the episode about the Two of Wands just a day or two after the spring equinox last year, which was not planned at all, but it blew my mind that we are ending with the Ten of Discs at the time of the autumn equinox a year later. So everything has fallen into place just right, 
And it just feels very special that we could take this journey together. And of course, the decans don't follow the cards in the same sequence. So the full year is represented on the decan wheel. But we can see here the symbolism of spring bringing life into the world after a long winter in the first card and autumn bringing us the abundance of a full harvest in the last card. And we need to make good use of this harvest. We need to make sure that it will last us through the winter until we can get another renewal and rebirth of spring. And this is also the meaning of Virgo. It loves to analyze and think of ways in which things can be improved. At the end of the cycle, we can look at all we have done with a critical eye and start thinking about what could be done better in the future. It's also a time to take stock of what we have and to plan how we will use it to survive the winter. And there is more depth to be discovered in the meaning of the sign of Virgo, but I think we will just leave it for the episode about the Hermit, where we will look into it in the most satisfyingly detailed way. Now I'm going to tell you a bit about the meaning of this card in Divination. The Ten of Discs shows us wealth. This is the completion and rewards from our labor, riches, prosperity. If this card describes a person, it will be someone very clever, who has some substantial riches, but sometimes this can be someone who is only interested in material gain and has little interest in the spiritual or even emotional life. This card is also associated with the management of money, so it can show an accountant or a financial advisor. In work-related readings, this will be another very positive card. It can show a pay rise, a promotion, a successful completion of a project. In some cases, this card can also show that there is nowhere else to go. We are at the top of what we are able to achieve, and this might be a good time to start thinking about what we want to do with our money and our skills next. We will need to find a way to bring some good into the world with our riches, and this will help us to feel fulfilled and happy. In relationships, and this card is a bit tricky to read, it can sometimes show the need for stability, a willingness to commit to a relationship, but as this is the complete energy, it can also show that everything has already happened in the relationship. And sometimes, if it's a good relationship, and this is exactly what we want, but other times, when we are hoping for the partner to change, or we are hoping that things will be different, this card will show you that if you continue to be with this person, it will just be more of the same. In spirituality, the Ten of Discs is quite an interesting card because it can show us that we have reached a certain stage on our spiritual path and we are now ready to move on and find a way to progress further. If the Ten of Discs shows up in your reading as advice, it might be encouraging you to take a look at how you manage your money and how you relate to the energy of money overall. If you have a decision to make, this card will tell you to decide based on a good use of your resources. As an obstacle, on the other hand, the Ten of Discs can be saying that you don't have the necessary resources to do what you planned. And maybe you won't be able to get funds, or you are lacking the necessary skills. It can also mean that you are not using your money in the right way. Maybe you just accumulate it, but there is no bigger purpose in it. Money can give us happiness only if we are able to enjoy it, and only if we share it with others. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching and please remember to like the video, leave a comment and of course subscribe to my channel. I would like to thank everyone who is already supporting the channel. I appreciate your help very much. And a special thanks to everyone who is here from the very beginning. 
And as always, if you find my videos valuable, you can show your support by becoming a patron or with a one-time donation through PayPal. All links are in the video description below. Thank you very much for considering this. Your support will allow me to continue making these videos for you. Once again, thank you all for today and I will see you in the next video about the Knight of Discs very soon. Thank you. Bye.